What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? After more than 100 episodes recorded with those very executives from companies like Disney, Amazon, Netflix, Cigna, and Google, the answer is clear. They learned lessons in leadership from the fields and courts of their high school and collegiate sports teams. Some of our guests' athletic experience earned them a place in their sports hall of fame, like Chick-fil-A chairman Dan Cathy. Some hung up their cleats after high school, like Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian, while others, like Condoleezza Rice, claimed they were terrible in their sport. But no matter their skill level, they have all told me that being a part of a team taught them lessons they still use as leaders today. In partnership with Maxwell Leadership, I'm your host, Don Yeager, here to give you an all-access pass to genuine, authentic, fireside chat-like conversations with today's business icons so that you can create powerful, positive change in your own organization. This is Corporate Competitor Podcast. With me for today's 150th episode is Chris Peterson, the leader of the Ernst & Young America Center for Board Matters, where she advises boards on their agenda, role and strategy definition, and long-term value. We thought it would be so special to celebrate this 150th milestone with a leader from EY because this podcast was born out of their study that found that 94% of women in the C-suite played sports. Chris is a recipient of Consulting Magazine's Lifetime Achievement Award. She brings a wealth of knowledge to the table, acquired throughout her career and enhanced by her MBA from Harvard Business School and years of swimming competitively. In addition to her corporate achievements, Chris's involvement includes being an advisory director for the NFL's Alumni Association, leveraging her expertise to make an impact in the sports world. Get your bonus resource ready from corporatecompetitorpodcast.com slash 150 so you can take notes on her wisdom. Businesses are just people. As a business doctor or a management consultant, you're getting called in on an assignment for a client when there's some problem, when there's pain going on somewhere with the patient. Meet the patient, diagnose, put a plan together, and then monitor the improvement. Good consultants get it. That people-patient engagement, that's super critical. Chris, thanks for joining us. Don, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be your 150th guest. It is incredible. So grateful for all that EY has done in the research of sports lessons it can teach us. It's great to have someone from EY with us for this milestone moment. The work you do covers so much ground, management consultant, strategy formulation, customer experience, and now board advisory services. There's a lot of entrepreneurs who we talk to who would love to serve on one of those boards. You've said that throughout your professional career, you've always been eager to step up, step in, accept new opportunities. You're not afraid to say yes. Yeah, Don, I definitely am a yes person. I see the world through rose-colored glasses. If you don't say yes, then nothing comes your way. Yeah. As I've gotten older, I'll sometimes say yes, but modify the answer so I can control the situation a little bit better. When you just say yes, you can work yourself ragged trying to keep all the yeses. But I'm a big advocate of entrepreneurs to consider board service right now boards are really grappling with all this emerging technology and how do they govern the technology portfolio at their business and even understand these technologies enough to weigh in on what the company should be doing around them. So we're seeing the emergence of things like a digital director, often younger, often different skill sets than the typical board member that was a CEO or a CFO or a in the more traditional role. So I always tell people when they're thinking about board service, go get yourself educated on what a board of director does, figure out the board game because it is different. After you get some basic grounding, then it's really figuring out which of your skills 
are the most useful to directors around you in the board world. Learning what are the committees of the boards. Boards bring in new members when they have openings in the committees. Well, where might my skills fit a board committee? Do you know what those committees are? The story of what you bring to the board is critical. And then thirdly, it's going to where directors are. You can't just hang out in your house and hope somebody's going to call you up to be on a board. Put in the time. You need to meet people. 20 years ago was the first time I was asked to be considered for a corporate board role. I was at a Colorado football game tailgating. I see the president of one of the local banks here, a big bank. He says, Chris Peterson, we're running a board of director search and we're desperate to find a woman. I had a little bit of board service done. You know, I'd done some not-for-profit boards and a little bit of private board work, but nothing to this caliber. Out of my mind, I say, oh, of course, I would love to interview and I'd be happy to be considered. Great. I'm going to let the CEO know I'm on the search hey, committee. Okay. My heart sinks. Oh my gosh, like this is the big leagues and I need to get my bio in and all this stuff. I had none of that. Well, ironically, the next day in the Sunday Denver Post, there's a big article about the start of an organization called Board Bound to help aspiring women directors land board seats. I mean, it just fell from the heavens to me. I learned how to write a bio, how to think about my board narrative, what I would say in an interview. A board's role is very different than a manager's role. A board is there to govern, to ask great questions, to check in with the management team. You're not there to run the company. So that fine line between governance and management is different and unique. Also portraying your stuff. When you go to a board of director interview, you don't talk about your operations experience and the management stuff you've done. That's what we do all day. You talk about how you'll govern from a board of director perspective, what committees you could sit on, what's your experience governing and providing policy and ethical dialogue. Right. And I landed the role. But it was because I said yes, unequivocally, that was my first corporate board seat. And that really changed my career. And here I am leading EY Center for Board Matters. I serve on the national board of Make-A-Wish. To your point, I've learned so much of what it takes for us to serve in those kinds of roles that are very different than whatever we might do in leadership. Yeah. Where would you go to find places to hang out? NACD has local chapters and local events and community engagement where you meet other directors. There is a lot of organizations out there. If you search board of directors and events in your city. So I'm keen on getting out and meeting people that are directors or aspiring directors. And there are a lot of aspiring director programs that yeah. are working together to help bring their peers on the boards. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And it's just getting into that ecosystem. Right. It's a journey. It takes some time. I also suggest that aspiring directors really look at not-for-profits first. You need to build your board bio and engage. It's a lot of work. It is. It's very intentional. I like that. Exactly. So prepping for today's conversation, I read an article where you mentioned that you communicate your appreciation with direct gratitude, spotlighting your team members often. Teach us what you mean by direct gratitude and maybe give us a best practice. Gratitude and empathy are the key leadership traits of this era. They were so critical during COVID. You know, my team and all of our workers struggling to balance life, work, kids home, trying to be a parent and a teacher, dealing with sick parents, whatever it was. When those folks are showing up to work for EY and my practice, it's a gift. I'm so grateful that they're there and they're able to sacrifice so much of their personal life for us, for me, for the good of our team. So when people are struggling, I'll write a handwritten note. I'll check in, make sure they're okay. Really getting to know my teammates personally. Mm. I know everybody's spouses. I know their kids. I know their names. I know their name of the dog. I mean, 
I ask about them. How's so-and-so doing? Well, Charlotte just had her first day of school. How'd that go? And make it a point to talk about that and family in team meetings. I talk about my husband. People know my husband, Rob. They know he's a golfer. They know he's dealt with myeloma and blood cancer the last 10 years. They've been on that journey with me. They know our daughter who's at college. They were with her on her college application process. A little of that goes a really long way. And then I do try to spotlight my gratitude often in public. So we'll have team meetings every other week. I'll always call somebody out. Hey, Dan, awesome job on this or that or that. Really appreciate that. I'll try to go out of my way to almost make somebody squirm a little bit because I'm talking about how wonderful they are a lot. And I also try to do that in public events. So I'll bring a junior staff with me to a conference who might have done all the research for me. I might call them out from the stage. Hey, Allison, thank you. Great data point. Let's give Allison a hand to thank them in a public way. Whatever the public way, it's golden. I was that person. I've been a management consultant. I've been in these kinds of firms my whole career. I've had all the dumb jobs. I've gotten coffee. I've been the PowerPoint girl. I've done it all. When I had leaders and mentors that did that for me, it made such a difference. So it's genuine. It's pretty powerful. Name for me one of those people who did something like that for you, maybe a leader in your past who you still think of today that maybe role modeled this for you. I always say my mentor is an amazing senior partner named Peggy Vaughn. Peggy and I spent Oh, a good decade and a half together in these kinds of firms. She's since retired. But when I joined one of the professional services firms as a consultant, Peggy was very senior. She was the only woman on the board of a large multi-billion dollar global company. I intercepted with her around some work I had been doing in a new area around value creation or business case development. And she really took that to heart, that this was something that could really change the profession. She would organize reasons for me not to only come meet her and be in her presence, but as a manager in the firm, I presented out to the board because what I had to say was so earth shattering, <laughs> right? Yeah. Now in my later career, I realize that she was proud to show off some new stuff we were doing as consultants. But when it came right down to it, she saw something in me and she wanted to expose me to all these senior partners. I was pretty new to the firm, but when someone like that puts you in front of a board and you slam it out of the park, pivotal turning point for me. And I'll tell you, I am so loyal to her. She could call me right now. I'd say, Don, can you hold on? Because I need to talk to Peggy Vaughn. She probably needs me to do something. And I will always say yes and go out of my way to help her. She did that for a handful of us women in the firm that she saw with potential. I've been underneath her wing my whole career, even more senior. I won a large consulting lifetime achievement award a few years back in New York, and I had her introduce me. Mm. It's always Peggy Vaughn for me. And I hope that I'm that Peggy Vaughn for women who work for me and feel like I've brought them up and given them exposure and helped fast track their careers because I see something great in them. You know, I love that. And one of the things we know about great teams is great organizations have a mentoring culture. It's not just that they have a mentoring program, check a box, I've been a mentor, or I've been mentored by somebody. Great teams, actually, it's a cultural piece of who they are and what they do. It's Peggy Vaughn giving to you, you giving to that next. What advice would you give to leaders who want to develop that mentoring culture? Well, something that I've seen work really well recently is the idea of finding reverse mentors. Mm. A reverse mentor might be somebody in my organization, kid out of college two years, that has a lot of potential and I need their help some way. Some of these young guns I used to help me with my social media, especially when it was earlier, and forced me to learn it and become pretty proficient there. 
They used to get on my calendar, show me how to use these different platforms, help me write stuff, make sure I was doing it, track stuff for me and say, you know, we really need you to respond on this, whatever it is, but finding ways that the younger guns can help the old guard. And then you create those relationships in an authentic way. It's useful really for both parties. What's so cool about that story that you're telling there is that it was not part of a program. There wasn't some organizational mandate that you have to pick a young person to go learn from. You saw value, they saw value, and everybody's better as a result. That's where the mentoring culture comes to play. Exactly right. I love your thesis, culture is the key to winning teams. I'm with you. Companies that have winning teams spend a lot of time on leadership development. They spend a lot of time supporting that younger generation that you really see as the future for the firm, making sure that exceptional talent is coached, has stretch roles. Somebody's really caring about their career. They're under some wings of some senior leaders. All those things make those stars want to stay and quarterback the teams of the future here. It's a whole lot less expensive to keep one than it is to go find one. Exactly right. Looking at your history, you grew up in California, but you went to high school in Germany, graduated from Frankfurt American High School. While there, you ran track, you played softball, you competitively swam for 15 years. Really incredible. Is there a memory from all that chlorine that you recall that <laughs> poured into the way that you would learn to conduct yourself later as a professional and a leader? Definitely. And growing up in Southern California, I'm also the daughter of a professional lifeguard. My family, we didn't swim in the pools, Don. The pools were wimps. We were <laughs> swimming open ocean. We were swimming in lagoons. We were swimming in marinas and bays. That swimming is hard and makes you tough. My sister and I, she's a year older than me. We would go to the beach with my dad every day in the summer. And dad would just put us in every swim class. We might be five and we were swimming with the 16-year-old life-saving class kids. And we might be six and we were in there with the 10, 11s doing distance swimming. That was our babysitter. So we were in swim class all day long and we were good swimmers. So if there were races or meets or whatever, we were in them all. One time, you know, there was some open ocean, long race. And there's my sister and I, and we were always little, sometimes the only girls. And a couple of big boys were like, yeah, right. And I remember my dad pulling my sister and I next to him and said, go kick that boy's butt. You prove that you are worthy. Please tell me you kicked their butt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my dad also wasn't very PC. Sometimes he'd say, you know, don't swim like a girl. Don't throw like a girl. But he was really pro girls. He was pro athletes. He was pro you can do it and you can push yourself and you can beat these boys that are just pop them off. And when you did, man, what a great feeling and a great high. And, you know, early on in my career, I'd be often one of the only women at the table, but I always kind of could hang with the guys. I always had guy friends and sports and I never saw myself any differently because I think my dad just expected, of course you hang with the guys. It wasn't ever even a question. You know, I always wished I was a boy because I really wanted to be a football quarterback. With my dad, I'd go throw passes and I'd QB the powder puff teams. And I was always a QB of the intramural sports in college. Growing up as a beach kid in Southern California was such a treat. You can hang against anybody. It doesn't matter who they are, what they look like. Boy, girl, you're a winner. I love it. The opportunity, the expectation, the standard set there allowed you professionally not to be intimidated in an environment where you might have been the only. Exactly. That's the beauty of that EY study that we talked about. Tell our listeners, if you would, how participating in those sports help you succeed in business. Those early experiences at winning, pushing yourself, going the extra mile and asking more out of yourself than you ever thought was possible. Those are the kinds of rewards that come with athletics, especially at young ages. When that's instilled in you, you want to be the person where the ball goes when it's stressful. You want to be that quarterback, the power of being personally fit. I am an 
everyday exerciser. I got to get my workout in or do something. I feel better when I've exercised. My head's clear. I'm more balanced. I'll sleep an hour less so I can get my workout in. Staying fit and healthy, that's important. My career is a tough one. I'm on the road a lot. I travel a lot, but I never use it as an excuse to skip something because I feel so good. Those endorphins are important to me. I'll often meet up with a colleague at Chautauqua Park here in Boulder and go on a little hike, walk and talk and visit. I like to do stuff like that, even with teammates. Yeah, I heard that you do hike meetings. I do. I do. It's amazing. Just uninterrupted, say, 90 minutes of a nice, easy walk, hike and talk and then grab lunch after and maybe get a pencil out then and put on paper what we've been pontificating about. It's a great, fun way to meet somebody, to talk, to learn more about them personally, and to solve some problems because you're doing something really healthy. So I love to have the ball. And I mean, I still do. I like to be in the spotlight. I like to be the go-to person with the hardest problems. Even though I'm not always the smartest person, I know I'll outwork everybody and I'll come up with a solution because I'll work with the team and we'll do it together. Those are all just great basics that you learn in sports that transitions, especially to women leaders. And it's why in our study, we find so many women leaders have sports backgrounds because all these things are really asked of you in business. And when you've been used to that pressure in your sport, it translates pretty well. Yeah. And you learn, you learn how to win, you learn how to lose. Yeah. Sometimes learning how to lose is a gift in its own right. You know, one of the things that stood out to me, you serve as an advisory director for the NFL's Alumni Association. Tell me about that work with former NFL players. What have you learned from them? The National Football League Alumni Association has two mandates to care for kids kids in local communities who love the game of football, keeping the game alive. And the other part of the mission, Don, is caring for our own. So caring for the retired NFL player that didn't make a lot of money and got the crud beat out of them. So the Alumni Association of the NFL strives to help with their physical, mental, and financial well-being. Mm-hmm. We fund research around concussion and brain trauma and make sure that the members are able to have access and benefits to advanced medicines and different trials and things like that, to name a few things and making sure that they're healthy. You know, some of these guys forgot they're not eating at the training room table every day. Some of these guys are heavy. They can hardly walk. They're beat up. These men typically played for an average of two and a half to three years. And that's in the pros. These guys have spent their whole childhood, middle school career, high school career playing football. It's all they know. The most successful folks that have transitioned realized that that was only part of who they are. And so to be educated in all kinds of different ways, to be exposed to things beyond the field was equally important. It's the reality that the elite sport isn't always going to be what defines you. Our elite athletes can be so all in in their sport and there's a lot of goodness there. But at some point that ends. That's true for many of us in our business too. Yeah. Yeah. We regularly define ourselves just by whatever it is that we get to tell people is on our business card. That's right. And so keeping an eye of what's next, how could I use these skills in my next walk of life? How could I give back? How do I branch out and open up? Those folks are in a constant state of what's next for me and kind of branch out beyond the sport, I think is is really important to do. That's a great lesson and one we can all apply. We'll never play that game at that level, but there will be a moment where life will change. Have you thought through how you'll do things? That's really great. Yeah. You know, you had a quote, being transparent is critical, especially in our socially connected world. So sugarcoating doesn't work anymore. 
It's true. I mean, it feels like so many of us are always trying to paint a picture. Yeah. And telling people the facts and the truth is so critical. You know, when you're being snubbed, when somebody's not really giving you the true story, our little spidey sense sticks up. We know we're not being talked to honestly. You got bad news for me. I just want to know it. Just tell me what it is, get it out, and then let's talk about it. Mm. A topic that boards grapple with all the time is cybersecurity breaches. Cyber risk is the number one risk always on the director mind. Our last five years of risk surveys, number one, what are you most worried about that the board has to govern? Cybersecurity breach. In a case like that, it's all around being practiced and talk about with the board what happens when we have a breach, because we know we're going to have one. We call them tabletop exercises. What would we do if this happens, if we have an ethical breach around one of our executives? How do we act quickly? How do we game plan inside the boardroom? Who's doing what? What are our roles? Let's do some conference room pilots. If we have a breach, what are we going to tell the press? What are we going to tell our investors? Mm. What's our plan on customer information and management? All those things could be hidden and quiet and under the cover, but they're going to get out anyway. So you might as well be forthright. You might as well be ready with the basics so you can convey what you're doing about the problem rather than just trying to push it off somewhere and pretend it didn't exist. And especially with things so open socially through social channels, you got to be honest because, you know, in a day or two, it's going to get out there as a breach. So you might as well be the person that delivers in that case, the that news out formally to the press and to your investors and other shareholders and stakeholders about not only what the breach is, but what you're doing about it. Times of crisis is when the board is often asked to step up and engage, clarifying the roles of the board versus the management team, talking through hypotheticals, getting coaching from a PR firm, getting coaching from your investor relations team of what are you going to say and then pretend that happens and have the management team with the board together work through some of the problems. It's going through practice drills before the big day, which could happen. I love it. You know, I know that you grew up wanting to be a doctor. And then you realize that biology and chemistry weren't really your natural calling. <laughs> but you use the phrase to describe yourself now as a business doctor, businesses that you get a chance to work with. You're helping them kind of diagnose. Yeah. Well, like you said, I was going to be a doctor. You know, that was always the game plan. And then I hit UCLA organic chemistry and about did me under. I realized what I was most interested in was that patient doctor engagement. That was my vibe, not necessarily all the hard science. So I transitioned to something sort of close. I don't know how many people go from like a medical school to management consultant and consider that close. I, yeah. <laughs> As a business doctor or a management consultant, you're getting called in on an assignment for a client when there's some problem, when there's pain going on somewhere with the patient. We've got a business line that's failing in this part of Asia, or we have an operational issue in our manufacturing site here, or we have a low performing team and some culture issues here. So the first thing you do as a management consultant is go in and assess the situation and analyze what's going on, listen to the patient, talk to them, find out from different perspectives what's going on. And then it's all around diagnosing the problem, diagnosing the illness, figuring out some things to try based on other people's research and knowledge and perspectives, bringing in benchmarks. What could you be doing differently and better? And then putting in some fixed plans or try some things differently, or we're going to make some moves in this part of the organization or invest some more in this part of the organization, meet the patient, diagnose put a plan together and then monitor the improvement. Caring about the patient all the way through is also something I've tried to keep my eye on because mm -hmm. businesses are just people. 
I remember this one manufacturing line where a plant manager is having a disaster of a new line going in. He could not figure out what the heck was going on. We bring our team in. And in a couple of days, we had a good feel for what was up and could work with him and bring him along to guide the changes that company was going to make. Good consultants get it, that people, patient engagement, that's super critical. Businesses are just people. Too often, it all boils down to profit and loss, the stock prices or whatever it is. Yep. Forgetting that at the end, we have to affect the people in order to be able to make it happen. You know, the phrase sense of purpose is one that you talk about a lot. You know, it feels like a big purpose for you is building a more balanced working world, especially for women. But there's a lot of challenge in this world, balancing work, professional ambitions, family life. What advice would you give to those who are listening who might be struggling with balance? Great question. And I actually came to EY from my last company because of the opportunity to build our purpose practice here at the firm. Purpose is definitely central to my being. As a strategy consultant, I see purpose as sort of that Uber strategy, the why of the organization, so critical in so many aspects. You did nail it. I mean, my personal purpose is to build a more balanced working world, to know when you need to say, hey, I need to do this for myself first. Work is always going to be there. If you're asked to help work around the clock on an assignment a couple times, like that's okay. It's for the good of the team. You see the leader in there with you. We're working together with a shared purpose. Sometimes I need to sacrifice something I'm going to do personally for the good of this mission. If it's all the time, then as a professional who's caring about their own wellness, it's okay to say, you know, I'm going to go take a run and eat dinner with my family and I'll be back online in a couple hours or at 6 a.m. in the morning. I'm going to go get some rest. Ask for what you need because these companies will take every ounce of you that you have to give them. Mm. You have to say, uncle, for right now, I need to go do some things and take a bit of a break. It's perfectly okay to do that, Don. I mean, good companies are going to push you as much as they can, but they also want their best people to stay. And a lot of times these, you know, hyper work around the clock managers don't even know what they're imposing on their teams. And because they're a workaholic doesn't mean everybody else on their team needs to be. So ask for what you need. And if you keep asking, keep getting shut down. Maybe it's not your place. Exactly. Yeah. Many people refer to the corporate organizations as teams. You've been on teams, you've been around teams. Often they're not really teams. They're just a bunch of disconnected individuals who work together. If you're counseling a leader how to take people and get them heading in a similar direction, give me a couple of steps you would offer to some leader who's trying to learn how to build a team. It's all around what is the shared purpose of this team? Do we know that? Do we really palpably get why we all are here and why we're going to work so hard? And have we phrased that purpose in a way that everybody kind of sees himself in it? So that shared purpose is most important. And then it's really assessing the team members. Do we have the right people on the team? Do we know who they are? Do we know what skills we have? what holes we have. Coach Prime's right now doing it Colorado, going through the roster, and he's making some hard moves, bringing in some new blood, and that can be really important. It's also about assessing the team culture. Is there a problem? Is there something in this team that's holding us back? It's often a person. I mean, do we have somebody that's kind of toxic that probably needs to move on? Oh, um, that's a hard one to ask. Right. And how do we find a better home for that person over time so the rest of the team can really get about doing their work? That's so graciously put. Help them find a different home. People's intentions are usually good. Sometimes it just, for what you're asking them to do, they're just not, it just doesn't fit well for them. And everybody kind of knows and we just don't do anything. Well, 
leaders should do something about it. Find out either enough coaching for that person to change that behavior that's toxic or really orchestrating some kind of a change for them, I think is important. Yeah. It's also critical for teams to celebrate their victories. Mm, yep. You do good stuff all the time together. Again, it gets back to being grateful and telling people thank you. We do a lot of events in our center and we always do a debrief after them. Part of it is just because we can all revel in the coolness and the awesomeness and we tell everybody how awesome it was. It's just like it feels good. We just need to do the fist bump in an hour team meeting and brag about how awesome we were. Celebrate the good stuff and lean in on that. I love every bit of those. Gosh, I just took down seven nuggets right there on team building. Really powerful. Chris, so grateful. These are the kinds of days that I love to be able to share with others lessons from people who have walked a really unique path like you have. Those who might be interested in some of what EY is doing in your space, what's the best way for others to maybe connect with you, to connect with what they're doing in your space? Yeah, LinkedIn is great for me. I'm pretty active out there. So just Chris Peterson out on LinkedIn or Chris Peterson it's with a D dash EY, you'll find me out there. So LinkedIn's a great connect point for me. Awesome. We'll put that link in the show notes. Great. Thank you so much today for being a corporate competitor with us. Well, I appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. Don, thanks for all you do to keep uh, us athletes moving forward on the corporate front. Appreciate it. My first great takeaway from this conversation was how Chris talked about the importance of gratitude and empathy as key leadership traits for this era. That we're in a time and a place where we need as leaders to share that gratitude. I, I loved her concept of doing it in public events, calling out junior staff members and, and allowing others to know how grateful you are for them and doing that while getting to know your teammates. <laughs> it was so funny. She talked about knowing the names of the dogs of her employees. How strong is that? Wouldn't you want to work for that? The second real great takeaway was this idea of mentorship and not just mentorship as a program, but mentorship as a culture. It's infectious when someone mentors you how much you want to turn around and do the same. I loved her discussion about finding reverse mentors someone who has the potential to help you grow, but in the process, they're getting access to a leader that maybe they wouldn't otherwise have been able to do so. And the third was right off the bat, as she talked about the power of saying yes to opportunity as a strategy for professional growth. Chris made that a point early on in her career, as often as she could say yes, say yes, and look at it as a place where you get the chance to grow. If you could share one habit, one thing you've done consistently that allowed you to separate yourself from your competitors, what would it be? In my 30 year career, 2,500 of the greatest athletes, coaches, and leaders answered that question for me. This is Don Yeager who did that, uh, I was, that article I was telling you about. Don Dave Sims with Coach K, how you doing? Hey Don, how you doing my man? What they gave to me is what I'm giving to you in my online course, Journey to Greatness. Through engaging storytelling and on-demand videos, you will learn the 16 habits that will jumpstart your personal growth. I will instruct you on how to apply these winning characteristics to your life through custom workbook exercises. We are slashing the price for our podcast listeners. Lifetime access to Journey to Greatness is normally $399, but for our podcast listeners, it will be $49 with the code podcast at checkout. Click the banner on corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to enroll.